Washington wants to bring back its dominant defense in 2024. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen today. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get started. All right, Lars. So we're, we're going to have a lot of fun today. One of the, the first things we want to make sure we talked about is a really interesting comment that Jed Fish made at the end of practice yesterday where he was discussing the defense and something where the last couple of years, you know, you and I have talked about just a balanced team and what that could look like. And he said, yeah, we want to make sure that we're still, you know, doing all the right things on offense. But right now the defense is ahead of the offense. No surprise there with, you know, breaking in all 11 new starters on offense, but I'm, I was really intrigued by this comment because we haven't seen a true dominant defense on Montlake in a while. And, you know, with the signing of Steve Belichick, with Bill Belichick being here helping out, we know he's a defensive minded guy where it just seems like they actually do have a chance to, I just, I'm going to be somewhat reserved and I'm going to say top 40 defense just with some of the pieces they've brought in and, and just some of the things we've seen. But yeah, it, it feels like a top 40 defense at the very least is not out of the realm of possibilities for this team. No, because again, when we've talked about it kind of throughout the early part of spring, right? When you look at some of the guys, right, they don't have a ton of starters coming back, but the ones that they do are pretty established. Cam Fabiculon and um, Alfonso Tupatal is in that mix, but then you have Carson so much. Car- well, I was going to say Carson wasn't technically a full fledged starter. So uh, that was not full fledged, but, but, but Cam Fab wasn't not. either technically since like it was, it was dominated. So for the majority of it, so it feels like I, I, well, I'm okay throwing Carson in that mix. No, and I am too, because again, to your point, all those guys that are coming back were almost kind of like the guys we wanted to push last year, right? When Cam yeah. Fab made those plays in the Pac-12 championship, Carson just being an assassin in pretty much any game, pick pick your poison. And there were so many other guys that, that what was the one thing this defense was missing? Well, there was a couple of things. What was the one major thing this team was missing last season? It was a side-to-side secondary, right? Where you can look at your cornerbacks, you can look at the safeties and know, hey, you know what? We actually got it. We we got it. And now again, a lot of that goes to efficiency price lock transferring in. That way you can kind of let Elijah Jackson and Thaddeus Dixon sort out that other side. But then you have Devon Banks and Jordan Shaw, who we mentioned, and the Leroy Bryant's made some nice plays this spring. Curly Reed's another one who's made some nice plays. And then we'll talk about it later on in the next segment. But yeah, there's just some other players yeah, at the safety position as well. So there's a lot of potential with this defense. And now they have the coaching to match where you mentioned Steve Belichick, but then John Richardson, where from Wyoming to Washington state to Arizona to Washington, dude can recruit, dude can develop. So I think it kind of, I, I know it's a sore spot for, for some Husky fans, but if I think a young Jimmy Lake, I told Levon Coleman that at Saturday's practice, I'm like, Hey, 2014 to 18, Jimmy Lake was darn near untouchable in terms of development yeah. and recruiting. That to me is what John Richardson is starting out as, right? He's got the track record. No, he doesn't have the NFL record, but he's got the track record for development. And so when you look at this team, it kind of makes sense where, yeah, it's an offensive minded head coach, but he very is aware that you have to have a decent defense. And you look at Arizona's defense last year. It wasn't what it wasn't top 20, top 25, but it wasn't terrible. Right. I mean, you look yeah, at Washington, it was, look it was at the, a very good look defense. At the, Right. I mean, look at the game in Tucson, where it's like you hold Washington to, what was it, 35, right? But again, it was 31. a very late 31, right? And so it was one of those, that first true test, right? And again, albeit at home for Arizona, but that showed, okay, hang on. You know, and then you get Anthony Ward, um, Isaiah Ward, all those guys, Russell Davis. There's so many pieces that have now kind of joined with the returning group that was already at Washington last season that I think Steve Belichick was kind of the perfect person to say, Hey, you know what? Let me bring in this NFL scheme, this four, two, five unofficially scheme, right? Officially, unofficially, we'll just call it that for the sake of simplicity where all these guys can max out their ability. I think it's a perfect defensive scheme for this, for this, for what the roster provides. And also that you have Robert Bala at linebacker, Jason Kafusi at D-line. You just look across the board, even Vinny Sinceri coming from the NFL to be the safeties coach. It's like you have a good blend of mix to where 
you can use the talent short and long term. And really, I mean, it's, it's what Chris Peterson's teams were both on early on, where hey, yeah, you had Jake Browning in 15 and 16 and 17 and 18, but really that defense carried the first three years of that program. No, you're absolutely right. And that's that's kind of the reason that we wanted to make sure that we hit on this because you headlined all the right guys there. And just a couple other ones that, you know, I, I feel like might need a, a quick mention as, as we just kind of go through some of the big names, Javon Parker being one that you and I have discussed a lot on this show, Zach Durfee being another one where it, it kind of feels like all the building blocks were there on last year's defense. We know it was never really put together, but they did enough in the right moments to help get the team to the national championship. And just looking at it now, looking at some of the talent that was in the room, because the defensive side of the ball was recruited fairly well. When, you know, you talk about Leroy Bryant and the, the class of, of corners that were brought in in 2023, you look at Javon and Armand Parker, you look at getting Zach Durfee out of the transfer portal, and then uh, Lance Holtzclaw being another one, where we look at all these guys and we say, yeah, no, this, all the all the pieces are there for this team to be successful, being the right spot. And that's why I'm so glad you mentioned each coach, because all of these coaches, and this is, I don't feel that this is a shot of the previous staff, but they all feel like a step up in terms of actual position coaches, where when you, we look at just Vinny Sanceri's experience and what his background is, John Richardson, as you said, what he's been able to develop, what Robert Bala has uh, been able to do and how fast he's risen, where I've heard some really, really good things about Robert Bala from Southern Utah to his time in Alabama that everybody just seems to just love what that guy's doing. And then Jason Kafusi is another one who's a very proven coach. And then of course, Steve Belichick being that piece that ties it all together. I really like all that, but in, it as, as great as the coaches can be, it all comes down to make sure it's tied together by a good scheme on the field. And that's something where, you know, you can go out and p make Steve Belichick a top dollar hire because you know, that's what you're going to get from him once you get him in the door, which is awesome. And you know, it's, it's, it's a conversation you've, I, you and I have had with our, our, our good buddy, Dan Raley and with the whole bunch of other people around the program, it's all right. Is Steve Belichick going to be a college guy forever? Probably not. Let's, let's be serious about that. But as long as he's around, you know he's going to put it, put it consistently. I and I I I I really trying to just refrain myself here, but awesome because I've I've watched the Patriots' defensive scheme for twenty plus years. I, I know what it looks like. I know it's it's awesome, and just. Whenever I look at it, I just say, okay, yeah, if he's going to bring this piece of it to Montlake, if he's going to bring that piece of it. And the thing that, you know, I, I got to ask him about a couple of weeks ago was what's the, the biggest piece of it. And he said, the fact that it's going to fit the players. And that's the thing we didn't see over the last couple of years. Cause I, I really like talking, talking to Chuck Morrell. I feel like I had a really good relationship with him, but it never felt like his scheme fit the players very well. We almost felt like certain guys were pigeonholed into doing one thing or into doing another thing. And some guys did very, very well in that role. Example, Braylon Trice, example, Jabbar Muhammad, and Afwani Lofosio. Some guys did fantastic in those roles, but you need to make sure that it also allows your guys the freedom to do what they want. And I feel like that's what Steve Belichick brings. Exactly. Well, I mean, almost in a way, it seemed like everyone, every position was out for themselves. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it just kind of like the, you know, the D, the interior G line was one thing. And then the edges were another, and then sure. the linebackers were another. And then the safeties were under Morrell, but the corners were under Juice Brown. And it just really seemed like, and it's no, no real shot to one person, except I guess if anything, it's to Caleb because he put the staff together, but it just seemed like, okay, we're going to, the cohesiveness that the offensive staff had, to not carry over to the defense. Whereas you look at Jed Fisher's staff, you can see everybody on offense has a game plan. Everybody else on offense knows what their assignments are. And then defense is the exact same way where Brennan Car or uh, Steve Belichick doesn't have a position, right? He does, he's not a position coach slash defensive coordinator. He is your defensive play caller. He's the defensive head coach, if you will. So that allows him to say, okay, all you guys are going to bring your thing to me. I'm going to watch every single position, right? You, I think you asked Belichick or somebody asked him, after after practice when he spoke, are you going to be focused on one position or not? It's like, no, I'm just going to kind of be going all around. Like, why would I focus right. on one position? Like, that's what these coaches are here to do is coach of their position to bring me the best version of them that they can be. And then I max out their talent in the scheme. That's how this whole cohesiveness works. That's how it's supposed to work. And to your point, how it didn't work last year. Lars, with that being said, look at, let's get to some of the younger standouts on this roster. 
right after a message from our good friends over at Game Time, because Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch, which is just an amazing thing for I, I know both of us, and you know me especially as somebody who just loves just going to baseball games and spending as, as much time as I can at T-Mobile Park. Be trying to hit up a couple other ballparks this summer, and you know, no matter what ballpark I am, I'm in, especially if I'm going to be watching the Red Sox, that I will be hitting up Game time for the best possible deal because they have last minute deals which save up to 60 percent off buying last minute seats for sports concerts comedy theater and so much more they're all in pricing if you toggle that feature it shows your total up front with no surprise fees at checkouts and they have seat views which give you a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets to game time download the game time app create an account and use code lockdown college for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and Use code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, Lars. So we made this very general on our our graphic for all our, our YouTube listeners. And we just put young standouts. And you and I, we came up with some parameters for this. Where, because, you know, sometimes sophomore now can be a third year player in the program. And this person, the player has to be in the program for two years or less. That's the one parameter we have for this. But that being said, who is your first young standout through four spring practices? So I'm going to continue the agenda that I've been beating. And that's Leroy Ryan. Because, again, every day he makes a different type of play where we look at Tuesday's practice. I believe he had a tackle for loss. I, I kind of looked up and heard the reaction, but it seemed like there was a, it was a not a pass breakup, but more or less a play that he had made coming off as a corner blitz or something like that. But either way, what Leroy has done in these first four practices to me is not surprising because it's, I don't want to say it's what I expected him to come in as last year, but it's almost like with the right coaching what he could have done last year, where you've seen sure. John Richards clearly have an impact on Leroy Bryant. And we and again we talked about it. Our corners again, you have some nice starters, but you're gonna need some guys at that position. And Leroy just seems like a guy who's gonna climb pretty quickly, whether it's through injuries or just outplaying guys. And I think that's no slight to some of the other veterans, right? But you just look at him; he's got the athleticism, he's got the ball skills, he's got the intel- the football IQ to make it all work. And he's certainly not afraid to go up against anybody. And I think that's kind of, to me, what stood out is he's lined up against multiple different receivers. He's gone against Jeremiah. He's gone against a couple other guys and held his own. Now, again, has he looked perfect? By all means, no. He's still a redshirt freshman for that reason. But I think give him another 11, well, 10 practices plus the spring game and then fall camp with the summer to develop, I think he could really be put together and see him see his name in the two deeps uh, come this fall, as long as he continues the progression he's on. So I like where you're going with that one. And I I'm, I'm going to stay in the defensive backfield here with my first one then, because I've got a couple names here and I'll, I'll just kind of bounce around depending on where we go. And I want to talk about Peyton waters here first, where I know it's somebody that you and I have mentioned once or twice already, but one of, one of the first things that I notice every time I see Peyton waters is I forget who he is. And I mean that in the best possible way where I look up and I just see number 22, which is not a number, you know, you and I looked at a whole lot last year in the defensive backfield. I'm just like, who, who is number 22? Because this dude is, is huge. He's got like a, a, just a real nice frame and it's, oh yeah, that's Peyton Waters. That's a true freshman safety. And he looks really good. He's been running with the second team a lot through these, these first couple of practices. And he's somebody where there was, there was always going to be room for one of these young guys, whether it be Raheem Wright or Rashawn Clark, who we'll see in the fall, or if it was going to be Peyton Waters, who made it up here in time for spring ball. One of those guys was always going to be ready and available in the two deep, or that's what it felt like, especially now that uh, Diesel Gordon is away from the team. We'll see if he comes back, what that might look like. There's just an open spot there where it feels like Tristan Dunn is going to have that third one. And then those three guys were battling for this fourth slot. And Peyton Waters being here during spring ball uh, seems to help give him an edge. He's got a really high football IQ from playing on both sides of the ball. And he's somebody who the more you watch him, the more impressive he is, where it just feels like you watch him and you just say, and you can just forget that he's a true freshman. 
And the more you look at him, the more you just see how high his ceiling is. And that's why, like, I've, I've seen some people liked him at corner. Some people liked him at receiver. I liked him at safety, personally, because it just felt like the best way to let him play freely and let him utilize all his talents, whether it be he needs to come down and play man coverage, whether it's identifying a play and helping out run support or just dropping back into coverage, that he's somebody who can truly excel in every area. And I'm just really excited to see that continue. Yeah, well, and it's funny you mentioned that those he played, you know, potentially could play receiver, could potentially play cornerback. Well, he did all three at Birmingham. So yep. um that was that was to me what I remember talking to him before he signed, and he's like, Yeah, I mean, I can pretty much play wherever. Just call me as call me a defensive back. Like that that's pretty much what, what Peyton Waters is. But he's more than just a guy that's like a flashy guy. I think the one part of his game that I'm intrigued to see develop is can he come down and be a hitter? How much can he play in the run sure. support? Because without question, I think he's got ball skills. I know you agreed that as a as a safety and coverage, I'm not worried about his development there. I'm just curious how much of an impact can he make as that second safety coming down in run fits and things like that. But I think both those guys are going to have another fantastic career. So one thing I want to do is go to kind of we're going to switch sides, go to the offensive line because again in a appreciation for the third segment, I do want to give a little bit of rose to Elijah Jaquette. Again, it hasn't always been perfect this spring, sure. but I, I think he's done. He's, he's met my expectations. I don't want to go too far down the road and say he's exceeded my expectations, but he certainly hasn't underwhelmed. I do think they're trying him at a number of different positions. And so I think his best suit probably long-term is left tackle, but I think he's going to play first at right tackle. It won't be starting this season. It won't, I don't, I would not count on that but I would almost expect him to start at right and then kick over to left down the line in his career. But I like what I've seen from him because, again, when we talk about installing an offense, it doesn't matter if you got Parker Cross, Cam, it doesn't matter who you got slapping you the ball and protecting you. you got to figure it out. And I will say, to your point about Zach Durfee and some of these other pass rushers, the offensive line, yes, they've been getting blown up, but it hasn't been every play. It hasn't been yeah. every other play. It's like there's been – it's almost it almost kind of goes in ebbs and flows in practice for like, you know, the first 30 minutes the defense is just killing them. Second part is the offense, and then the third part is kind of like a break-in, even, even between sort of thing because they've been doing, you know, short yardage sort of things, kind of third and down, fourth down, third and short, fourth and short. And I, I would say about us. 50 50 60 40 split the offense is getting it the defense is topping him so it's a good kind of barometer to see where these young guys are because we know elijah Jaquette and some of these other guys are probably not going to start but i don't think it's a far-fetched idea that they're not going to play this season so i think elijah has certainly put himself in contention to earn playing time with how he's played through the first four uh practices in spring so I w- I'm going to stick on the offensive side here because I've got I've got two people that I, I wanted to hit on. I'm going to go real quick on the first one because I just I need some time to, to rave about the second guy. The first one is Sione Fasolo, where he's somebody who, in a similar mold to Elijah Jaquette, yeah, it seems like he's going to play a lot of different spots this year. They're trying him out all over the place, just kind of seeing what's best for him. He's so big. He's still so projectable in terms of his frame, in terms of what he might be able to do, that I'm really excited to see where the future is going to take him. Because it feels like, you know, he's somebody who we could see playing right tackle in a couple of years. If he is ahead of Elijah Jaquette at left tackle, that's also not something that would honestly surprise me. Where I, I've just been really impressed with everything that I've seen from him. And in terms of what he is able to grow into is going to be so much more impressive when we talk about him. I, I want to say this time next year where, you know, if a couple of guys come in as one year offensive line transfers and then dip out. I wouldn't be surprised if Sione Fasolo is one of the favorites to just take one of those spots and run with it because it seems like he's got all the projectables, all the intangibles, but the guy that I really want to make sure that I talk about because he has gotten better each and every single practice is Damon Williams. And he's somebody who I, I've, I just couldn't be more impressed with him where, you know, we got to talk to him on Tuesday after practice for somebody who's still supposed to be in his final semester of high school. He did a fantastic job handling the meeting. He did, did a wonderful job dealing with that. And then on top of all that, when you watch him on the field, he's got really great touch, as you've alluded to n- numerous times. And he's also got nice zip on the ball where I don't think we mentioned it yesterday, but he had a, a back shoulder throw to Jeremiah Hunter where the ball fell incomplete. 
but it was placed perfectly and it got on Jeremiah so quickly. He was almost surprised where he was like, Oh, Oh yeah. I, I really didn't know that he could spin it like that. They had that kind of velocity. And it was really impressive. He did a fantastic job. And this is all without mentioning arguably his best aspect, which is his movement ability and his scrambling and his ability to make plays outside of structure and get outside of the pocket because he's been so good at just placing the ball where it needs to be that it, it still feels like there's more to build on for him. And, it's just it's exciting to see what's going to be next for him as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned about because I was kind of as we were going through this, I'm like, well, do we want to acknowledge the quarterbacks and we want to we make it about to. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to your point, we do. But the one thing I'm glad you mentioned that because it's his pocket awareness that really has separated yeah. him from Demar uh, Demarcius. Because again, they both got good arms, they both got they both can kind of do some things, right? But when you look at what he's – even when he's got to stare down the barrel with pass rush coming this, this, in the spring, he's still been able to find – been able to kind of scoot around the pocket where he's – his first and first and second instinct isn't, oh, pressure's coming, got to get outside. Pressure's coming, got to break left or right. It's He wants to step up and around. He wants to – he, he kind of creates his own movement in the pocket, and that's the pocket awareness where, hey, I don't want to just be a runner. I want to be a guy that can throw. And if I need to run, sure, I got the wheels to do it. but. I think without question, his arm is shown through more than that. Because again, we knew we knew what the legs were gonna be. We've seen the leg, yeah. you've seen it a couple of times in practice. No doubt the guy can run. But what is he here to do? Throw. And that I think he's honestly excelling more there than he has as a runner, which is kind of what we needed to see. Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more there. And Lars, that being said, you hinted at it. Let's get into some transfer portal needs that are elsewhere than the offensive line. Right after a message from our good friends over at FanDuel, because it's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to place bets on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel is America's number one sports book, and, you know, I I about them yesterday. I'm going to do it again today. If you know, you're, you're on FanDuel and you happen to see some, some Jackson holiday AL rookie of the year odds, you should place those sooner rather than later, because I mean, Hey, we're recording this before he is able to play in his first game, but I'm just so excited about the future for that kid. And it feels like the sky's the limit for him. And he could be one of the best players in the MLB sooner rather than later. So, Lars, where do you want to start here? I'll, I'll hand it off to you because I know there's one person that you want to talk to in particular. Or not, not talk to, you have talked to him. Talk about. I was going to say, I was like, I think you mentioned that a couple. Yeah, so let me let, let me just give, give me 90 seconds on Philip Lee, right? Where he had his first official visit to Washington uh, this past weekend. Obviously, couldn't have gone better timing-wise, right? Having Bill Belichick, the coach's clinic. But it wasn't even really about Bill Belichick. It was about who else was on campus, right? Danny Sheldon, former UW defensive lineman, who played for Bill Belichick's and Roman's Patriots for two years, um, 2018 and 19. Um, and, and Danny walked in with him in practice, walked over to him with the Dempsey, was talking to Bill, and then, you know, and, and really what happened was Philip got a great sense of how he can be used and couldn't be happier saw the coaching staff and the relationships that he can build, couldn't be happier. And so the only reason he isn't shutting things down is because, to his credit, he's got a ton of other schools, LSU and Oklahoma are the next two that he's going to take. Um, Eric, actually, I believe he's in Baton Rouge today. Well, Wednesday as we're recording this for Thursday, to be clear. But he's still in Baton Rouge on Thursday. Um, and then he heads to Oklahoma um, next weekend. So – whether he takes visits after that, we'll see. But without question, he knows Washington is going to be there until the end for him. And when you look at that defensive line, we kind of hinted at it a little bit yesterday where we like Sebastian Valdez. He's got experience, but not at Washington. Javon Parker, without question, going to be a beast, but hasn't started. And then you look behind them, and it's Armand Parker who's had to rehab for a couple of years. It's Jacob Bandis who I – We kind of I'm know what his role is at this point. Right. And so you don't have that true disruptor and a guy who wants to kind of do a little bit of everything and wants to come in and take someone's job. And if you're going into the Big Ten with one year, why not go get a guy like Philip Leedy to pair next to a Valdez or a J1 Parker and have in that rotation? And one thing Jason Capucci told him, I was like, hey, look, that's what we need. We need somebody to just take ownership of this, where it's not that these guys can't, 
but they almost could use that extra mentor, right? That extra body along the defensive line, which is other kind of, I know you're going to talk about a couple of positions where that's, that's kind of the case at other positions as well, where you don't need a full fledged bona fide a one starter, but you need some complimentary help. And I think Philip Bleedy would be a fantastic complimentary help. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's, that's one, one of the reasons I want to make sure we talk about tight end again. And again, that's no, no, none of this is going to be surprising. It's more just, you know, we want to reinforce these assertions as we've watched four practices now. And it's just more apparent than ever when the transfer portal opens on Monday, all the national analysts are talking about, Oh, this is going to be the craziest transfer portal we've ever seen. Like uh, so many insane things are going to happen. And it feels like Washington is going to try to find a way to be a part of it because a, there, there are a couple offensive line pieces away from ha- especially from having a really solid team. But if you can find depth at a couple of positions, tight end being a big one, then it, it, it just feels like, you know, at an eight and four, nine and three season is not out of the realm of possibilities. And tight end is going to be a big part of that where we've talked about Quentin Moore. He's looked really good at the first four practices. Shout out to him. He has put in a lot of work and has gotten a lot better. He, he's been very impressive, but then behind him, it's all questions. Ryan Otten has, you know, struggled with injuries and other things throughout his UW career, which t- through, through no fault of his, but he's just not somebody that you can consistently rely on yet. We still like his potential, but he has not shown that he can be somebody you can rely on yet. And behind him are Decker DeGraff and Charlie Kroll. We like both those guys as well, but they're true freshmen. So that's not necessarily somebody that you're going to, you know, throw in there and just say, yeah, we believe in this guy to come in and, you know, have five, 600 receiving yards as a true freshman. We were really excited about Josh Cuevas in that role. And then he transferred to Alabama. So now it feels like there's, there is at least one open spot. I don't think they take more than one guy at the position and, you know, we'll see what that looks like when the portal opens. I would keep an eye on it at the position in the at first week or so, I would say just to see what might happen there. Because if you can get one guy who maybe has a little bit of college experience and just have him around there as a tight end two t- or tight end three at times, depending on, you know, how you feel about Decker or Charlie or Ryan behind Quentin Moore, just as somebody who can come in as a receiver every now and again, and just be there in sets and just still want to run block and be able to do that effectively then that could just go a really long way for this football team in terms of, you know, personnel groupings and other things that I know Jed Fish and Brennan Carroll are going to want to do. Right. And say, so I think we, we don't, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you say. I just wonder, given that you're talking about Quentin Moore's graduating, everybody else has got two plus years of experience. I don't know if Ryan has two plus, but in terms of two more, this to is go, his yeah. third year. Yeah. Right. So Brian's got two more to go and Decker's got four more, four or five more to go. So the point of what I'm getting at is whether you bring in one transfer, unless it's a graduate transfer, I wonder if you might bring in two, right? Because no disrespect to Quentin Moore, but are you leaning on him being your A1 starter or would you like him as your tight end two? And then if something happens, injuries, whatever you want to call it. So I think I still think there's a way in which you could probably get two if you can find a grad transfer. Just, just it's it more or less. I gonna, disagree. I think, the only I think I think the reason why we can disagree is because let's see how the rest of spring plays out, and then if Ryan is able to stay healthy through spring ball, then you could say okay, we can we can count on it because if you can, so now you're counting him out. It's not that. I just don't think that tight end is a position that is one where you can spend six scholarships especially when this coaching staff has said they want to add five or six bodies on the offensive line alone. So when I look at that, plus when you just, when you go back and just watch what Jed Fish's offense has done and not just his, when you watch, you know, his predecessors who we learned this offense from the Kyle Shanahan's, the Sean McVay's of the world. Yeah. They run multiple tight end sets, but it doesn't, those aren't offenses that truly support, multiple tight ends at a time or, you know, you can argue what Kyle Shanahan does in, in San Francisco with Kyle Hughes, who is a pseudo tight end that just plays fullback. And you know, that, that, that is what it is, but it doesn't necessarily support multiple tight ends. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to once again, point at San Francisco with George Kittle. And I'm by no means comparing Quentin Moore to George Kittle, but if you want somebody who as awesome as George Kittle is in the passing game, he is an excellent run blocker. And that is something that Quentin Moore is, I, I would say that that's his best trait. And that's going to be the number one thing that they're looking for. And if he leaks out and, you know, they they run a whole bunch of crossing routes with him and he's able to rack up five, six catches in a game for 45, 50, 60 yards. Great. It's awesome. It's not going to be what you're asking him to do, but that's still something he can do. And that's, that's perfect. Who is the Tanner McLaurin in this room right now? 
The Tanner McLaughlin? Or Mc, McLaughlin, yeah, sorry. I don't think there is one. That's the that, and I think that's what I'm getting at. It's like there's a nice there's a bunch of nice pieces in that room, but, but there's no what, right, but that's what I'm saying. Where th- whoever you want to go out and get from the portal could be somebody that's more of a true receiving threat. But I think it's I, I don't necessarily know if they're going to go the grad transfer route and they're going to want to get somebody with a little bit more experience because you go and you take a grad transfer who's going to be here for one year. <laughs> You're sitting in the same spot 12 months from now. Yeah. Well, but the other thing is that you show the 25 class, which you can start to build up. And again, we've, we've talked about the number right. of guys that they like in that class. So they're definitely taking two and 25. So it's not, but again, I, 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 that, that might actually be more to your point where it's okay. Exactly. You're, 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 you'll kick that one down the line. And so aside from tight end, is there one position group on offense or defense, not offensive line that we can both agree does need at least one significant transfer? Because I'm, I'm thinking about, I've been thinking about it for a little bit. I don't think safety is as, as egregious as I once thought coming into spring. It's obviously not. corner corners loaded, Linebacker, they got Anthony Ward and Drew Fowler on scholarship, so you're probably content there. I I would take a receiver, and it's I not wonder. not that I don't like the bodies. That's that's just where I would go with this. I would take a receiver if it's like the same kind of player that we're alluding to at tight end, where it's a like a younger guy that you can mold, that you can get what you want out of. Because, or or even if it if it is a grad transfer, who maybe you don't expect that kind of player to start but you expect that that player to be in the rotation a decent amount. That's, that's something that, you know, wouldn't be surprising where there are a whole lot of different ways you can go with this, but that's probably where I would say the biggest need again, outside of the offensive line would be in terms of just the, the, the restrictions we put on ourselves here. And then we're, where are we at with running backs? Because do you take a running back? If what I'm saying, if you, because that, because so and I'm not talking about this. uh, Yes. I'm not talking about this just from the Tybo scholarship perspective because you're also looking at Sam Adams who hasn't done much sure. in a couple of years at Washington. They they looked at Rashad Amos. I don't think they go for a guy like that because you have I Cam Davis it. and Jonah Coleman. But you kind of want that third back. And if it's not going to be Tybo and it's not going to be – unless it's Daniel Ngata. I, mean, I think that, that's the enigma of the room. So, if Daniel Ngata can find the field, I don't think you need a running back. You bringing up Rashad Amos has changed my tune a little bit. Where if Rashad Amos says, I want to commit, I think they take him. Where I'm I'm 95% certain he has two years of eligibility remaining. Just from the way that, you know, when I was, we were studying him a little bit more closely when it sounded like he had committed to the previous staff and then just didn't announce when everything happened and understandably backed off his commitment. Where I would see that, I can see them taking him because he's a really talented guy. And with, with somebody in a position like that, who's got experience under his belt. You can certainly find a role for him this season as an RB3 where I, I got a question about, oh, well, what about Damian Martinez? That's not happening. That is absolutely not happening. But Rashad Rashad Amos, that certainly can happen. Where that's somebody who, yeah, you work him into the rotation this year, next year is the guy, and he goes off to the draft. And that, that all works out really well. And Lars, with that being said, we're going to get out of here for today. Thank you, as always, for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your constant support. And please, you know, if you run into us for spring practice, feel free to say hi. We we love hearing that you enjoy the show. It really does mean so much to us. And if you're new to the channel, hey, welcome. Please feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating the channel with new content every single day. So please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit like on the video. Click that little bell so you never miss when we post a new video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to leave us a comment down below. And if you're audio only, please leave us a five-star review as it really does help the show out a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on Friday.